Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. On July 4th, 1881, U.S. Minister Levi Parsons Morton was presented in Paris, France with the now famous Statue of Liberty. This statue was a gift from the French people commemorating the alliance between France and the United States during the American Revolution. However, to the person proposing the gift, it meant oh so much more. You see, Edward de Lubile proposed a monument be built as a gift to the United States for the perseverance of freedom, including at the time, the late President Abraham Lincoln in the pursuit of abolishing slavery because he felt all peoples deserved the natural rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This week's hero felt the same way, and he ran his team that way. And it all revolved around a little town called Hammond in the state of Indiana. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is December 18th, 1881. And we are in Hamilton County, Indiana, to witness the birth of another unsung hero of the NFL, Dr. Elva Andrew Young, or just better referred to as Doc Young. Now this Doc, why is it so important? Why does this reference to the beginning with the Statue of Liberty come into play? He was born just about eight months after the initial unveiling of the statue in Paris, France. And just like the Founding Fathers, He was a founding father of the NFL. But his biggest contribution to the league was not just being present and being a founding father of the NFL, sitting there September 17th, 1920 in Ralph Hayes Automobile Auto Showroom in Canton, Ohio. No. He would have a different type of impact on the game. But we'll get into that. How did he have an impact on the game? How was he even invited to that September 17th, 1920 meeting? Well, Doc Young represented the Hammond Pros. And we're going to talk a little bit about the leading up to that meeting. And most of this information comes from a well-written article from Bob Carroll on the Pro Football Researchers Association website, which, of course, I'm going to leave a link to that in the show notes for you. By the way, you can get to the show notes through your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Again, that is thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, while you're at it, I ask that you please subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest off the press episodes well each and every week. But let's get into Doc Young, a name that I personally never heard of. He is also someone that we could say is synonymous with the success of the early NFL days. But as a doctor, how does he even become to the point where he's able to be one of the founding fathers of the NFL? Again, we're going to go back a little bit, but a side interesting note is that according to the same article, he was a descendant of the brother of Brigham Young. You know, the whole BYU and Steve Young, probably the uh, biggest NFL star that ever came out of that school. But football was not his only game. Sports were in his blood. Doc Young loved all sorts of different, he was a horse racer, he was promote boxing, he was in baseball, all sorts of different things. But he always did have an interesting tidbit, like, oh, it's this football thing. I, I'm kind of curious about what's going on here. So his football career began in 1915. He served as the team doctor from 1915 to 1917 for a team called the Hammond Clabby Athletic Club. And an 
article, another one from Roy Sai and the Pro Football Researchers Association, kind of described who the Hammond Clabbies were. He said, The 1915 season for the Clabbies started with manager John Hartley putting out a call for players. This was published in the Saturday, September 4th edition of the Lake County Times. All candidates were to report to Harrison Park the next day, promptly at 9.30 a.m. This same call for players was also published in the Detroit papers, as some of last year's players were from the Detroit area. End quote. So, you're just throwing out a call to players the day before in the newspapers, and you're hoping everybody shows up? It just seems like a haphazard way to organize a team, but that's how it was at the early stages. That's one reason why a doctor who wasn't necessarily a football player, was able to begin a football career and ultimately become one of the more important individuals at the beginning of the NFL. And sometimes it makes you wonder, though, how did this survive? Well, again, Doc Young. From this story, people like him that were dedicated to trying to get the league to survive, not just winning the games, were one of the reasons why this league ended up being successful, and they were oh so critical. But let's go back to the Hammond Clabbies. The Clabbies, how did they even get that name? You see, they were sponsored by, well, the Clabby Athletic Association. But where does that association get their name? You see, Jimmy Clabby was a famous boxer of the time. In fact, he won the 1910 World Welterweight Championship, and he was one of Hammond, Indiana's most prominent citizens. So they named the whole athletic club after him. And then, of course, they named the football team the Hammond Clabby Athletic Club, because they were sponsored by that club. It's just a little bit different. They were considered professional football players, but it's not the same as it is today. Now, fast forward a little bit to 1919. The article also stated that Paul Pardoon established a strong Hammond team, known as the Hammond All-Stars, where their home games would be played in Chicago at Cub Park, which is now Wrigley Field. So on the map, it's like, I'm looking, Hammond is about 35 miles or so away from Wrigley Field, and I'm not sure 100% why, but i got to imagine it's because they didn't really have many stadiums that were capable of playing these games. So they really didn't have too many home games. But there was an interesting tidbit that came out of that 1919 season, because one of the players was named George Hallis. He was the star end for the Hammond All-Stars. And it was said that Doc Young was probably a part owner, but he was also the doctor and he did a lot of other things for the club. But after the 1919 season, it kind of went to a wrong turn for the Hammond All-Stars because many of their players would just leave. Uh, They also saw that a lot of their players miraculously showed up on the Chicago Tigers rosters, which also played at at, Cub Park, which is Wrigley Field nowadays. But nonetheless, something did come out of that 1919 season. Because according to the NFL 100 site, it is said that the American Professional Football Association, now NFL, was initially deemed viable because of a 1919 game between the Hammond Pros and the Canton Bulldogs that boasted somewhere between 10,000 and 12,000 fans. Hmm. So, the Hammond Pros played in a pivotal game. A game that would deem the league potentially viable. So the Hammond Pros, even though We know nothing about them nowadays, and we don't know who Doc Young is. (laughs) They were a team that helped create the NFL. So, of course, we're going to flash forward to 1920. Probably, again, one of the reasons why they were invited to that September 17th, 1920 meeting in Ralph Hayes Auto Showroom to get to the point where they are creating the league and Doc Young is a founding father of the NFL. But that's about as good as it gets for the Hammond pros as far as on field because they didn't really have too good of uh, standings. I mean, even though there weren't really official standings that were kept back then, the NFL.com website had the Hammond pros as a 2-5 and record that first year, only ahead of the Columbus Panhandles and Muncie Flyers. And curiously enough, they played only against three league opponents and they lost all of them. So uh, let's get back past 1920. Let's move to 1921. They were almost in the middle of the pack, but they only had a 1-3-1 and one record, according to the NFL website. So it just, not too successful. I mean, just imagine how the money must have been super tight at that time, because 
it, the only way you get paid is if you have fans coming to the games. You can have gate receipts and, of course, paying for other things. But if you can't feel the roster, well, I mean, that's not really going to help you out. And if you can't have a winning record, who's going to want to come and watch you play? And from that same Bob Carroll article, kind of shows you what happened to the team there in the 1921 season as far as, you know, making money. It went as such. According to one story, Dr. Young promised each member of his 1921 squad 5% of the game profits. Supposedly, after the team's opening game at Buffalo, each player received $67. A few weeks later at Evansville, each player earned around 65 cents. Ironically, Evansville was the only league opponent Hammond had defeated that year. End quote. So you're saying, one time I'm making 67 bucks, and then I'm making only 65 cents. I'm not so sure I'm going to stick around too long. And at the time, mind you, $67, that's a whole lot more money than it is today. Even though it's nowhere near what our professional athletes make, it was still a pretty good wage at that time in history. And much of the Hammond Pro history I found would end up revolving around Doc Young, because he was the primary catalyst for the team. I mean, as a doctor, he was kind and giving. He was known that, you know what, you can't pay your bills. I'm going to treat you anyways. I don't care if you have insurance, whatever, man. Let's just get you fixed up. If you have debts with me, well, did what you could do. Don't got to pay me anymore. And that was just the type of person that he was. And he had that mentality with his NFL team because he wanted to make sure that the league survived. So I think that even though Hammond Pros didn't have a very successful in the box score type of standings, we do have them to thank for what we get to enjoy in this 100th season as we watch, hopefully, well, it's too late for my Detroit Lions, but we watch somebody else that we want new to get to the Super Bowl. But according to his son, Harry, Doc Young thought that Wilbur Fats Henry was the greatest player he had ever faced. They actually tied the vaunted Canton Bulldogs 7-7 to one year. They could hold their own every now and then. But also from his son, there was a commonality with Fats Henry. Hey, it has nothing to do with football, but I thought it was kind of funny to see this. He said that, quote, He was a heavy eater and loved pork chops and apple pie for breakfast. He ate all the things a modern doctor forbids. Just imagine that. Pork chops and apple pie for breakfast, and you're a doctor, telling people what to do. But regardless of the situation, he also supposedly got in an argument with Curly Lambeau over the type of ball that they were going to use in league games. At the time, what was called the Spalding J5 was kind of like watermelon shaped. It was good for drop kicking and all those sorts of things. We talked about Curly Lambo. Ah, it was quite a bit ago about being, you know, the last great drop kicker. But he was known to be one of the best passing quarterbacks in the league at the time. So he was all like, hey, I want a thinner ball because it would be, make things better for the passing game. So it was one of those deals of, hey, you just want to try to get a leg up on everybody. And the other guy's like, we're, we're, just, we're trying to make the league go fast forward and stuff like that. But regardless of what it was, here we are. We have in 2019, a passing league. But back in the early 20s, all in all, the Hammond Pros had a 5-26-4 record in the NFL. They would end up getting kicked out in 1926 when the NFL was just trying to basically boot out teams because it was getting out of hand too many teams and trying to manage everything. So ultimately, they actually got rid of 12 that year. But one reason that it was difficult for the Hammond Pros, it is because they had to play basically all of their games. They were technically away for the most of them. Because like I said, remember, they had to play up at Cub Park in Chicago. They're in Hammond, Indiana. That's a whole state over. Granted, the states are next to each other and it's really not that far away. But still, they really didn't have a true home field. So how are you supposed to get the loyal fans? Especially in an era where they didn't have the radio broadcast. Especially in an era where you don't have TV. You don't have the internet. You don't have fantasy football. All these other things. So I can understand how it was difficult for them to feel the team, get loyal fans, and to stay active in the NFL. But even though they were unsuccessful in the box score, and their standings did not have anything to write home to mama about, they still made a major impact on the league. Not just because Doc Young was one of the founding fathers of the NFL, but because Doc Young was one of the few that was willing to employ African-American players in the early days. 
and his son Harry said this, quote, Dad was not a civil rights activist as we know them today. He was simply colorblind. And it was brought up a point in the article with Bob Carroll, and it was mostly different kind of quotes from his son Harry, the Doc Young's son Harry, that is. He brought up how the Ku Klux Klan was prominent around the main areas of professional football. Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and all sorts of other things, of course. But it's something to think about at the time. And the KKK, you know, I don't have a whole grasp on the full story and history of how that all went down. I mean, I've been told certain things throughout my life. I've heard only of certain things. But it's got to be very difficult to try to run a league. you got to be harassed probably by all the other players around you, or coaches maybe, even the fans. But Doc Young, he stood his ground. Just like his son Harry said, he was colorblind. He didn't care. Everybody was the same. Just like we talked about at the very beginning of the episode, when that French dude who his name is kind of hard to pronounce, thought that everybody deserves equal rights. So this is starting, and it was one thing that probably added to the difficulty factor for becoming successful in the NFL. But regardless, this is again from Doc's son, Harry, from the Bob Carroll Professional Researchers Association article. And it's a quote, and it goes as such. The black players had a rough time in Indiana. The Christian church next to my grammar school had a fiery cross burning from its steeple. Many times I would see a KKK funeral after school with the white robes and masks. I remember we once played a game in Kokomo and the restaurant had signs that said, This is a 100% American establishment. No coons, kikes, or Catholics. They refused to feed our black players. I don't know what dad did, but I do know he cussed the apple knockers. Ink Williams kept his helmet on the whole game. Again, think about trying to start a league and already having people not believe in you. But being willing to go against the grain, to do what you feel is right. And I do not know a whole lot about the KKK and its resurgence and the whole hatred that was so much more than I realized. But getting back to this narrow little thing, to football, how much of an impact did having black players on the team affect the teams willing to do this at the beginning? I mean, young Doc, he didn't care. To him, it was just the right thing to do. And probably his most famous player was Fritz Pollard, 2005 Hall of Fame inductee. He won the first ever NFL championship with the Akron Pros. And he was one of only two African Americans in the NFL at the beginning. And in 1921, he would also become the first African-American coach in the NFL. Back then, they were players, coaches, and all sorts of other things. They were playing double duty. And we'll have to have a show just on Fritz Pollard and the trials that he had to go through at the very beginning of the NFL, later on in the uh, series. But again, this was probably the biggest contribution that Doc Young and the Hammond Pros made to the league, being the most inclusive team in the league in the early years. The team may have only had 35 games in NFL history, and unfortunately for them, the total record was only 5 wins with 26 losses and 4 ties. And after being kicked out of the league, there wouldn't be another NFL team in Indiana until the trucks pulled in at Indianapolis from Baltimore on March 28, 1984. However, the 5 wins that meant the most to the league were not the W's in the box score. For your seat, out of the 10 African-American players in the league in the early years, five of them played at one point in time for Doc Young's Hammond Pros. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude podcast and were able to gain some gridiron knowledge nuggets of the most inclusive team in early NFL history. If you liked this episode, I ask that you please share it with a football geek such as yourself by sending them to thefootballhistorydude.com. Now next week, we get to learn about the other half of that 1919 game that deemed the NFL a viable pursuit, the Canton Bulldogs. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. 
We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.